What is good, everybody? Welcome back to another episode brought to you by the League FFB, more specifically, an episode of Let's Talk Dynasty. And today, what we wanted to do for you was an in-depth dynasty breakdown of the AFC South. We're going to talk about each of these teams, give some predictions, but more importantly, talk about players that are undervalued, could overperform this year, could break out, sleepers, all of that good stuff. Everything you need to know for the 2024 fantasy football season and for your dynasty fantasy football leagues, we got you covered. AFC South edition. But as always, this would not be an episode of Let's Talk Dynasty without my co-host. So you know what we got to do. We got to get him into the building. So let's not waste any more time. Let's hop right into today's video and let's start talking about some fantasy football. How you doing, man? Yeah. Oh, yeah, man. I'm doing pretty good. Good, man. We got the AFC South today. Look, we, we're recording this on Sunday. So if the people at home don't know, we record two of these episodes right now because um, we're doing two a week. We're recording them on Sundays and then they're coming out. So um, we just watched yesterday your Chicago Bears, Caleb Williams. We got to see J.J. McCarthy uh, and my Minnesota Vikings. So this is... um. I, I don't know. What are your takeaways, man? What are your takeaways from, from Caleb? You know, people compare him a lot to Patrick Mahomes. But while I was watching that game yesterday, I, it was like the ghost of Aaron Rodgers playing in the Bears uniform. I think he's way – and that's, that's who he idolizes too. So I think he's way more of Aaron Rodgers than Patrick Mahomes, still two Hall of Famers. But, like, I'm not trying to get too far over my skis here about, you know, because it's preseason. But there are certain things that even in preseason – you know will translate to the into the, to the regular season his command at the line his calmness like just seemingly knowing what to do like even on his bad throw his bad throw because he only had one it was a pass interference basically or um obstruction or whatever so yeah man i'm i'm all i was already in now i'm like all in yeah man i mean he i thought he looked really good uh, i couldn't I hate to say it as as a vikings fan i mean him being on the bears you know i like caleb even before he was in chicago but the reality is I was watching and I was like damn this dude's really good like he's he's about to be a problem at the NFL level like it's it's about to be a problem um but maybe slight overreaction like you said just one one preseason uh week one game now talking about over reaction i want to just say you know something that bothered me yesterday uh as you know jj mccarthy his first drive under center for the Vikings. That was an interception. Jack Jones is out there. DB that last year, if you're not familiar with who Jack Jones is, he made that like crazy one-handed interception on Patrick Mahomes at the line of scrimmage. Yeah, that's the DB that intercepted JJ McCarthy. And it was his third throw in the NFL. Now, typically that wouldn't bother me. You know, he's a developmental quarterback, a guy that we knew kind of needed to get a little bit of reps under his belt at the NFL level. But I thought this is what everybody was saying during the draft process. But all of a sudden, as soon as that happened, my phone lit up like Christmas. I I had text messages from people talking about J.J. McCarthy threw an interception. Uh Uh-oh, J.J. McCarthy bust, blah, blah, blah. Told you, J.J. Absolute ridiculousness for everybody to watch three plays of J.J. McCarthy, which, by the way, the first throw was a very good throw. It was a nice throw. He sensed the, you know, pressure in the pocket, stepped up, made the throw across the middle of the football field. Then Then he tries to force one when he uses his legs running out. Uh, running out of the pocket, rolling out. It was ridiculous the amount of people overreacting. And then everyone went hush the rest of the evening because J.J. McCarthy is throwing, you know, 45-yard touchdowns to Tristan Jackson down the sideline, layering it between a DB and a safety. And then he's doing it again to Trenton Sherfield, and he's making all these plays. Nobody said anything after that. But everybody wanted to text me and talk about the interception. I thought it was ridiculous. Anyways, I thought he looked pretty good. I mean, everything that you wanted to see out of him, I thought you saw what you wanted to see. Obviously, you don't want to see the interception, but I'd rather him throw it, you know, first drive in a preseason game than him throw it in the regular season. Like, this is where you do that. So uh, I thought it was more impressive that he made the mistake, went back to the sideline, talked with Coach O'Connell came back out the next drive, seemed like he fixed the mistake right away. Like, I, I thought that was the most impressive part of the thing. Yeah, I mean, I, I think J.J. McCarthy was really impressive. People were hating on people were hating on him. One of the people were hating on him, 
yeah, they, they got quiet when he started playing well, and they got quiet because Spencer Rattler looked buns, but um, <laughs> <laughs> that definitely shut that person up. But uh, yeah, man, J.J. McCarthy was in, impressive to me. Honestly, I'll be completely honest, I didn't even see the play of the interception. I did see every play after that, though, where he was looking impressive, looking calm in the pocket, throwing strikes down the middle. So, so yeah, like I, I came away from yesterday's preseason games like, are we going to have three good rookie quarterbacks out of this draft people are definitely here's what okay i do think that the the jay mcdaniels is a little the ball looks very impressive coming off his hands but come on he scrambled into the end zone whoop de do <laughs> yeah apparently but, he changed that play they said he changed that play that was not the play that they called at the line of scrimmage but he audibled it himself yeah i would have more been more impressed if he audible audible it into a pass instead of him running <laughs> so Fair. and i think i think you said jaden mcdaniels which i think is a basketball player but um not saying <laughs> you said McDaniels. I, I got one this week. Yeah, I I hit the Doug McDermott last week, and you got the Jade. It's fine. We're it's okay. You can tell we watch basketball too. Um, but look, man, I I, I agree. I think there's going to be a lot. Brett Coleman, um, love Brett. Uh, he put out a tweet on Twitter that I thought was uh spot on. He said. The NFC North, right after watching the Vikings game, he said the NFC North is about to be an absolute bloodbath. And it will be. (laughs) It's going to be a bloodbath for the next five years. It's going to be fun to watch. Um, But we're not here to talk about the NFC North. We're here to talk about the AFC South. So why don't we hop into today's video? I don't want to waste too much time. That's a long intro. If you skipped it, you skipped it, whatever. Uh, Let's hop into the Tennessee Titans because the Tennessee Titans currently have a projected win total of six and a half games. Uh, Not a lot of wins projected for the Titans here in 2024. Now you look at some of the changes here in Tennessee. This is a team who was 6-11 and last year. They missed the playoffs. In the offseason, they add additions of Calvin Ridley, Tony Pollard, and Tyler Boyd. Nothing major in the draft outside of the offensive line. And then they also added a new coaching staff. Mike Vrabel fired, moved on from. They bring in Brian Callahan of the uh, Cincinnati Bengals, and he brings in his high school team mate and former Jacksonville Jaguars passing game coordinator Nick Holes to join him uh, as the offensive coordinator. So just initial reactions to the six and a half line. How are we feeling about this Titans team, man, And at, at six and a half games? Um, they're going to be buns. I wouldn't be surprised if they don't even manage to get six and a half wins. That's way too close to seven when really I think we're looking at like a five win team. So yeah, I don't, I don't see the Titans as uh, too, too impressive. Uh, they're t- one of the top wide receivers. They're already hurt. Leave us. We will. We have to see what he has going on. Yeah, not very, not very enthusiastic about the Titans at all. Yeah, I mean, I think it's going to come down to whether or not Will Levis is the guy. Um, six and a half wins. If Will Levis is the player of the future at the quarterback position for the Titans, six and a half sounds doable. I mean, they've they spent a lot of money in free agency, adding some uh, veterans. Maybe not the most youthful uh, guys. Maybe not the most. Uh, of players in their prime, but Tony Pollard, Calvin Ridley, it's better than what they've had there over the last couple of seasons. You still have Tajay Spears there, Chigga Conquo. Um, I I don't know, man. It it very much feels to me like we are going to learn very quickly whether or not Will Levis is the quarterback of the future here. And if he's not, this could be a team that's going to be probably in the top five to 10 teams in the NFL draft next year, looking at potentially a Shadur Sanders, a Carson Beck, uh, one of these quarterbacks in the near future. So um, I, don't, I don't know, man. I think the six and a half games, if I had to make my bet today, I, I don't think that Will Levis is the quarterback of the future. So I'll go with the under on six and a half. I mean, I like Will Levis to a degree, but it's like, yeah, he's definitely not a slam dunk candidate to be uh, one of the next star quarterbacks in the NFL. I would definitely take J.J. McCarthy over him, and I might even take Michael Phoenix over him. So that's just where we'll live. It's just so. where we're at. It's just where we're at. Um, but yeah, I'll go with the under. Now, as far as the ADPs go, players that we should be watching for Dynasty, uh, little change. Now, last week we were using underdog ADP. This week and moving forward, we're going to be using keep trade cut um, because I feel like it just makes a lot more sense. Uh, Superflex KTC, players being drafted in the top 50 or ranked in the top 50. You got Will Levis as quarterback 23. Tajay Spears as running back 19. 
Calvin Ridley as wide receiver 45, Tony Pollard as running back 37, DeAndre Hopkins as wide receiver 68, Chig Okonkwo as tight end 23, Traylon Burks as wide receiver 88, and Tyler Board as wide receiver 91. So knowing that these are where they are currently ranked in dynasty rankings right now, I want to really just start off the conversation with, does anybody feel right now misvalued? And if they do feel misvalued, why? And where do you think that they should be moving uh, by the end of the year? Honestly, I think those values are all pretty good. They're all pretty fair. Um, I like to see the fact that Tajay Spears is still kind of getting respect, even though they brought Tony Pollard into the room. I think Tajay Spears could have a big season if the Titans come to their senses and bench Tony Pollard or Tony Pollard gets hurt. We still collectively, I think I can speak for you, we still don't know why they brought Tony Pollard in. When they have Tajay Spears, but I could beat that horse until it's further dead, I digress. Um, but everybody seems appropriately um, ranked there. So, I mean, I don't have too many big problems with what they have going on. Um, keep track. Yeah, the only thing that I could even think about is, you know, you look at where – the wide receivers are ranked and I'll pull it back up on the screen. Um, Calvin Ridley and DeAndre Hopkins. I think that there's a real chance, you know, going into next year that Ridley moves up. If, you know, this passing offense does improve with Brian Callahan there, who has had a pretty good passing offense there in Cincinnati with the Bengals, uh, Calvin Ridley, because could improve. And I think DeAndre Hopkins, you know, another year where he's dealing with injury. I mean, he's dealing with injury already. I, I could see him move down. He's also older. Like, I, I think the community could get to a point where they're like, yeah, we're kind of done with DeAndre Hopkins at this point in his career. We don't really want him anymore. Uh, and then when it comes to the running backs, you know, Spears and Pollard, I think that gap could uh, separate even more. You know, if Pollard comes out, he doesn't look the way that he's looked over, or if Pollard comes out and he looks the way that he looked last year in Dallas and Spears still looks, you know, electric with the football in his hands, I, I think they could separate and you could really be looking as Pollard is the uh, the Miles Sanders of 2024 where he got the new bag, he goes to the new team, and he underperforms. Tony Pollard could be the Miles Sanders of 2024, and Tajay Spears is just Tajay Spears. You know, I would say that this this is going that's going to be on on dynasty receipts, but I think so too. So I mean, we're both going to have to put our our name out there. I think we both are doubling down on Tony Pollard being very very mid. Um, Traylon Burks, he can be out of the league, man. <laughs> like he should be worried. <laughs> Whether or not he's even going to get make the final roster for the Titans, um, this team, man, it's so weird because they have guys. They have guys on that team. Oconk, like they, are, it's almost like a team where if you put an actual quarterback on the team, they might be okay. Like yeah. Calvin Ridley, can I see him stepping up? Like you said, yeah. I mean, he he came back from last season was his first season back since you know I don't know when. So I mean, maybe now with like a full off season. He could get closer to the form he was at. I just think it was a real poor decision for him to go there. But, yeah, um, I, I don't know. I mean, I guess it came down to money, right? He just wanted money. Yeah, yeah, so, pretty much. Whatever. Um, it Almost it would have felt better. If I remember correctly, weren't the uh, Patriots pretty in on uh, Calvin Ridley in free agency as well? I feel like him going to play with Drake May might have been a better decision. I believe so. Yeah, you know they kind of been trying to get a, a wide receiver over there for a minute, pair with the rookie, yeah. They so. keep saying that they keep saying, "Oh, we're we're good, we're happy with our wide receiver room." But it seems like every time one becomes available, they're in conversations for that wide receiver. Exactly. All they're gonna do is probably overpay Keenan Allen next off season. Yeah, probably him or a guy like I don't know Amari Cooper, or DeAndre Hopkins. When DeAndre Hopkins gets cut, you know. But yeah, we'll see. Um, overall though, I I, I don't think there's a lot to take away from the Titans. I think that they're a pretty average football team. There's not a lot of exciting assets. Um, maybe a guy like Ridley undervalued. Maybe, you know, a guy like Tajay Spears can break out for fantasy this year, but all in all, it's going to come down to the development of Will Levis and how he performs with this football team under center. Yeah, we, I agree with you on that one. All right, well, let's look at the Colts because the Colts have the second uh, lowest projected win total in this division. They are going to be projected to win eight and a half games. You look at last season for them nine and eight this was without anthony richardson playing quarterback for the majority of the year it was gardner Minshew. uh they missed the playoffs in free agency and in the trade market this offseason really quiet not really doing anything there uh, but in the nfl draft they added a second round wide receiver in adonai mitchell who you know i love i know you love um they add him to this team now eight and a half games 
Anthony Richardson under center, new improved offense. How are we feeling? I feel pretty damn good. I mean, this team is a lot more worth getting excited about than the Tennessee Titans, that's for sure. Um, top to bottom, I feel like this team is young. This team could take huge step. Anthony Richardson is probably going to be one of the top fantasy assets this season. Um, but, you know, as far as the um, projection goes, I still think there may be a year away from being able to, like, do what we need to do. So I could definitely take the slight under. Like, I'm kind of in the middle on okay. the about Like, yeah, that's the slight under. Could I see them hitting a the projection? Yeah, but I could also see them fall a little bit short. Makes sense. I, I think for me, if I have to make the bet, it's probably right there close to the line, like you said. I mean, that's why Vegas sets these lines. They're so good at doing it that uh, it is what it is. But I think I'll take the over. Um, You know, you think Gardner Minshew last year got him nine games. Anthony Richardson this year with Shane Steichen. I, I feel like they should be able to get nine again. You know, nine games, ten games. I don't really know who's on their schedule at the moment, but uh, nine doesn't feel far-fetched in a, in a 17 game season so uh that just feels like i would take the over but maybe one of the lines where if i for the sake of the game i'm taking the over but if it was really betting in real life i probably stay away from the colts yeah probably so that's probably so, the ultimate smart thing to do is just stay the hell away yeah but i mean we talked about the fantasy options there's a lot of them here uh let's talk about these guys in the top uh 250 because you have anthony richardson as the qb7 this guy's played two games we got him as the qb7 already but he flashed in those two games jonathan taylor is the running back five Michael Pittman is the wide receiver 21 with Adonai Mitchell as the wide receiver 49. Then you have Josh Downs also as the wide receiver 52 and Alec Pierce as the wide receiver 90. Now, these are all of the players in the top 250. Um, I mean, what are we what are we thinking here? Does anybody stick out on the ADPs? Uh, let's see. Everybody looks pretty good, even though I feel like I don't want to overrate Adonai Mitchell, man, because I feel like I'm close to doing it. Oh, yeah, man, that might take I, a bump up. <laughs> I, I want to <laughs> overrate him. I, I think yeah. he <laughs> I think he's going to go up from 49. Yeah, I, I think so too. But like, I'm, my mind is on something like he could go above Pittman type. Like, I'm just, Ooh. I just feel like he's more talented than Pittman, dude. Like, that's the, that's the gist. I feel like he's more talented than Pittman. Now, Josh Downs is injured. Like, it's, it's all falling into place for like him to have a breakout season and become like a huge sleeper for a bunch of people. So, do you think he's more talented than Pittman? Not if he's better right now. Do you think he's more talented than Pittman? No, I really like Michael Pittman. I think Michael Pittman's really talented. Um, I, I Actually, I think that Adonai compliments Pittman very well. Um, I think they both play uh, different styles of football, but they complement each other very well. And I think that that duo of Pittman and uh, Adonai is going to be really good for them. Now, Josh Downs being in the slot, there's no question that when he's healthy, he is the slot wide receiver there. Uh, everything that we've been hearing out of Colts camp is that it's Adonai Mitchell and Alec Pierce competing for the opposite outside role i don't expect that to be a competition for too long um adonai mitchell will end up being the number two outside uh with Pittman there but this this offense is going to be interesting to watch man i think it comes down to um there's still something in the back of my mind where last year coming into the nfl for anthony richardson as a rookie i kind of was on the fence about jonathan taylor and michael Pittman in general because i was worried about the passing volume not not the quality that he could pass the football at, but the volume of which they would throw the football in Indianapolis. Uh, yeah. And I also worried about some goal line carries potentially going to Anthony Richardson, which we saw uh, in the games that he was healthy. He was rushing for, you know, goal line carries and things like that. So you saw recently, I sent you a trade where I tiered down from Jonathan Taylor to Travis Etienne, uh, yeah, got yeah. an additional... Uh, second round pick thrown in just made the little tear down I, I think that little bit of worry is coming back for me about the volume so with that being said you know what is what is it going to look like for Pittman and for Adonai there's definitely going to be enough volume for one of these guys um but the other is going to have to make do with probably less volume than we'd like to see for fantasy football. Now, Adonai Mitchell, he's a big play guy. He can do that. Uh, but yeah. it's going to be interesting. I just I, I'm I'm very interested to see how the passing volume looks here in Indianapolis this year. It's going to be interesting, man. Like Michael Pittman. Look, guys, I'm not crapping on Michael Pittman because I know you guys like to take everything I say and think that I'm <laughs> crapping on him. It's just like, OK, I look at Michael Pittman and they're, they're probably completely different with Steven. I'm talking about in terms of like where they stand in the offense like Mike, Michael Pittman is like Amari Cooper to me not necessarily the older Amari Cooper but like he's just like a god is solid like you 
depend solid, dependable, can do little things. I feel like Adonai Mitchell is closer to like a game breaker and a guy that like has that personality to be a star wide receiver, has that that arrogance, like that wild side. I'm surprised the Steelers didn't draft him. But <laughs> hey, he's got the it factor. You see it. Yeah. So I mean, I'm if if I'm a owner of Josh Downs or Alec Pierce, I'm real nervous because I don't think they're gonna take too big of the the share of the um receiving reps. I think Downs will probably be ahead of Mitchell at first, but that's not gonna last too long. And I like Downs. I just think he got a raw deal when that's not Mitchell got drafted. Fair enough. Um, I, I just want to go back to the passing attempts too. I just looked at where they were last year. Now keep in mind that was Gardner Minshew, not really any rushing upside at all. So you have to throw the football. They're playing from behind in a good amount of games, throwing the football. They were still the bottom half in the NFL. It, it makes me worried knowing that. Now, um, I do also want to just touch on Jonathan Taylor uh, a little bit because he's currently the, the running back five in these rankings right now. Um, knowing what we know, knowing that there is a, a chance for uh, Richardson to take some of the goal line work, yeah. do you think that there's a chance that Taylor falls from running back five to like a running back eight, running back seven, nine as the year goes on? He's also 26, so he'll be 27 next year. Creeping up, he's creeping up on that. And he had, he's had a ton of usage. Let me let me yeah. rephrase that because yeah. I know people are going to take it literally. He is going to be 26 this season. Currently, he's like 25 and almost 26 years old. He's going to be 26 this year. He'll be 27 next year. Yeah, yeah. He's still inching ever close to that to that wall. Yeah. He's inching ever close. I could see him taking a step back, a fall back, but at the same time, I could also see the Colts trying to get Anthony Richardson to like not run as much because of what happened last season so i mean i could definitely see a scenario where he falls to like running back seven or something like that yeah it'll be interesting because i'm like i'm thinking about you know how is the the market going to change over the next year and um you have guys like cmc who's going to be 29 years old next year uh and he's above jonathan taylor you have to assume that he falls from running back four i can't imagine that cmc will be running back four this time next year at 29 years old um especially if he's dealing with injury like he's dealing it with it right now uh jonathan taylor you know gonna be 27 i don't know you got guys below them like uh, devon achan who's 22 uh etn 25 barkley uh, Kyron Williams, 24. If Kyron Williams goes out and has another big year at 24 years old, like people might move him up those rankings and say, okay, we saw it once, we were skeptical, but we saw it twice now. Maybe it's the real deal. I don't know. And then you have the uh, the 2023 class with maybe a Trey Benson who ends up becoming a starter next year, maybe a Jonathan Brooks who looks good down the stretch, and a 2025 rookie class that is loaded at the running back position. Like this, this whole running back landscape could shift going into 2025. It's going to be exciting to watch. Watch, man, it's gonna be exciting to watch. The running back position is coming back. <laughs> the running we back position it. back, man. Um, I can't wait to see it, dude. Like, very interesting, very interesting. This, this man, there's so many. Like, just to go back to the quarterbacks for a second, there's so many guys right now that are good. Like, remember how we always used to talk about tight end renaissance? I mean, yeah. the thing that's underrated is a quarterback renaissance. We're almost to a point where most teams has at least a decent quarterback. Yeah. And then we have Anthony Richardson, where I do think there's a world. Let's, okay, let's talk about this for a quick second, because this is going to piss people off, so I want to choose my words carefully. <laughs> All right. There is some worry on my part. There's some worry on my part about Anthony Richardson. I kind of feel like people like him a little bit too much like me i'm still in wait and see mode with anthony richardson the anthony richardson vibe feels really season two justin fields is to me where it's like he could do all these things but like in the long run what's gonna happen because Fields, the thing that people overlook a lot is that fields was a really good fantasy quarterback yeah. like despite what you was despite everything of him losing his job getting sent to the Steelers, being a backup and everything and you touch on this all the time andrew the things they do in real life could have an impact on fantasy it doesn't matter if they're a top five top six quarterback and i just need to see anthony richardson one be a good enough passer to stay the starting quarterback for the colts and two i need him to stay healthy and to this point 
I have not seen that yet. And there are people who are putting Anthony Richardson amongst the top fantasy quarterbacks. I'm just saying that be careful. That could turn on you fast. That's all yeah. I'm saying. I mean, the, the drum beat is loud. It, it makes sense. We've seen flashes and that's what people want to see. I mean, it's the same reason why you and I are talking about how we think that Caleb Williams is going to be a problem. You know, we see the flashes. We, we you know, make that assessment. But uh, at the end of the day, um, you know, I, I think there truly is a disconnect. I mean, we've talked about it on, on multiple occasions where I told you, you know, sometimes real life and fantasy do not uh, coexist in the same same breath. Now, you get certain situations where it's it's bad, where like Justin Fields is good for fantasy football, but he's not good for the Chicago Bears and they move on. Right. right? But then you have times where like people were overreacting for years about Jalen Hurts. Well, he's not throwing the football that much. He's not doing that well, yada, yada, yada. He's good for fantasy, but are the... Are the Eagles going to keep him? Well, he's winning football games. He's winning games. He's taking them to the Super Bowls. Like, of course they're going to keep him. You know, it doesn't matter if he's not throwing for 5,000 yards. They're winning football games, doing what they're doing. So uh, that disconnect too, where it's like, People want more out of Jalen Hurts, but he's still winning games, so the Eagles are going to keep him, and he's going to continue producing. Like it, it goes both ways. Um, it's not always just night and day, but I agree. Um, we'll see what happens. I mean, if the Colts go out there a healthy year, uh, Anthony Richardson, you know, wins like five games. Like they might be looking at this and saying, like, "Whoa, wait a minute, what's what's going on?" Now, I, I don't expect them to move on from Anthony Richardson after the one season, but you know, it could bring up some red flags. Do I think that's going to happen? No, I said I'd probably bet the over on the uh, the win total, but at the end of the day, I see where. You're coming from yeah if anthony richard richardson gets hurt this season it's time to hit the panic button it's fair time enough. to hit the panic button <laughs> fair enough well let's uh talk about another team that was kind of thinking about hitting the panic button uh it is going to be the jacksonville jaguars now uh, i say that because everybody was talking about trevor lawrence being a bust this offseason it, it seemed to be one of the most talked about uh conversations all offseason until he got paid like one of the top quarterbacks in the nfl now the projected win total is eight and a half wins the same as the indianapolis colts but i put them above them because they did uh, have a little bit of a better year last year they finished nine and eight uh missed the playoffs as well but uh this offseason they go they add free agent gabe davis to the wide receiver room they obviously lose calvin ridley um and then in the first round of the nfl draft they added brian thomas jr out of lsu now this is an interesting football team because it's kind of been as you said wait and see and now it almost feels like it's prove it time uh, for the Jacksonville Jaguars in the Trevor Lawrence area or or era, do you agree with that statement? Do you agree with that? Yeah, Trevor Lawrence is a curious case, man, because he did look kind of just pedestrian last season. But the same, he almost like didn't have a sophomore slump. He had like a junior slump. But okay, so here's how I look at Trevor Lawrence because this all everything revolves around Trevor Lawrence here. Mm -hmm. Can we agree? Tell me agree or disagree. His first season should be a wash because the coach was Urban Meyer. Agree. Okay. So essentially, same thing with Justin Fields because these guys are in the same draft because that first year for him was a wash. Like he had yeah. Matt Nagy and, and yada, yada, yada. Okay. So now we're looking at his second season actually being his rookie season. And what did he do his second season? He showed flashes. He looked like a Close. guy that was poor be yeah playoffs and did well in the playoffs he looked like a guy poised he, he to beat be justin one. herbert in a comeback he, he did look like a guy poised to be one of the top quarterbacks in the league so we're looking at that season as his rookie season which was his second season his third season was a sophomore slump and even in his sophomore slump season it's not like he was horrible he just wasn't the guy that played and beat Justin Herbert in the playoffs because that guy was supposed to come out last season, gangbusters. So I think what we're going to see here in this upcoming season, I think we're going to see a bounce back from Trevor Lawrence, and I think we're going to see them do well in their division. Yeah. So I I'm going to take – I'm going to take the risk to say they're going to hit the over um, by a hair. <laughs> by I a hair. Think, I definitely don't. I think they're the second best team in this division. I agree with you. I yeah. think they're the second best yeah. team. Um, I, I think what a lot of people do not talk about for Trevor Lawrence last year, it seems to be like forgotten. Like people just don't remember it. Uh, but Trevor Lawrence was banged up pretty much the entire year with a multitude of injuries. In uh, week seven of 2023, he sprained his MCL and he didn't miss any games. He came back and he played hurt. Um, in week 13, he had a an ankle sprain that was pretty bad. Didn't miss any games. Came back and played hurt with the sprained MCL and the ankle sprain. Then he had a concussion in week 15. Didn't miss a game for the concussion, which is abnormal in the NFL. He didn't miss the game. Came back and played. And then in week 16, he bruised the right shoulder. He had the uh, the throwing shoulder injury. He missed one game because of that. So like the majority of the year, it was ankle injury, knee injury, 
uh, you know, concussion, shoulder injury. He was banged up, man. It it wasn't a great year health wise for Trevor Lawrence, and I think that impacted you know the play of Trevor Lawrence as well. Now they still won nine games. You know they were still fighting for a chance to be in the wild card uh, late in the year. It I, it feels to me like you know people are kind of not looking at the context of 2023 and are just saying like Trevor Lawrence is mid. We don't want him. He hasn't lived up to the potential. Well, the bar for Trevor Lawrence when he came in was Peyton Manning, Andrew Luck. Yeah, like that's the names that we were throwing out with Trevor Lawrence. So yes, he hasn't lived up to that bar. No, is he still, you know, an upper half quarterback in the NFL that you'd like to build your franchise around? Probably. Like, he probably still is. And so, I don't know. It, it feels like people are giving him the the short end of the stick. I agree with you. I think they're the second best team in this division. If I have to bet the eight and a half line, I'm taking the higher on that one. I'm, I'm going over. I think they'll win more than that. They won nine games last year, banged up. No first round wide receiver in Brian Thomas Jr. No uh, Gabe Davis. As much as people want to poo-poo on Gabe Davis, you know, putting him on the outside, he's an upgrade to Zay Jones. You know, Zay Jones is not uh, a world beating wide receiver. And then you have a Christian Kirk who's going to be healthy uh, this year as well. Evan Ingram, Travis Etienne it should be a good football team. They should be a solid football team. And um, yeah, man, I just I, I'm taking the over. I think people have kind of written Trevor Lawrence off. And to be honest, I, I'm all in on buying the dip right now. You nailed it. You beat me to it. I was just about to say that. If you are a team where you're not very comfortable with with the player you have as your super flex quarterback too, Trevor Lawrence is like the perfect target to put there because you can end up with two studs at the quarterback position in your lineup. He's like the perfect guy for that. I would definitely buy the dip on him because you barely hear anything about Trevor Lawrence this offseason. Nobody's making noise about him. Me, I'm holding firm with him as my quarterback one on the team because I think he's going to ultimately fulfill that position. So, um, um, I would buy the dip on him if he's available in your league. If you have someone who's kind of like, yeah, all right, I got Trevor. I would definitely target him. Yeah, I have him in two different leagues right now. I have two shares. One share, I paired him with Caleb Williams in a team that, you know, we're looking to to build a dynasty here. And I got Caleb Williams and Trevor Lawrence. The other one, uh, I have him with my QB one is Lamar Jackson. My Or not Lamar Jackson. My QB one is, I have too many leagues. Can't remember. <laughs> Uh, but then I also have Jared Goff on the team too. So like you get some, some decent QB play out of Jared Goff for the majority of the year, but talking about the dip, let's look at the ADPs because you have a top 250 here for the Jags. Trevor Lawrence is QB 13. He has an ADP of 31. So late second round, uh, I mean, a early third round pick, uh, in those 12 man leagues, you got a, you know, 10 man league. You're talking about, he's a fourth round pick. That's kind of crazy. Um, but then you have Travis Etienne as RB7, Brian Thomas Jr. as wide receiver 29, Christian Kirk, wide receiver 38, Evan Ingram, tight end 12, Gabe Davis, wide receiver 73, and Tank, good old Tank Bigsby, uh, cracks the top 250 <laughs> at running back 59. So just looking at this, I mean, we've, we we kind of already have talked about Trevor Lawrence being maybe undervalued, um, at least properly valued at the moment. Like we're buying in at the floor. So I think we expect if we had to make a bet, he's fine to purchase at this price. And I think he might even improve upon this. How how about the other guys? BTJ, Travis Etienne, Christian Kirk. How are we feeling about these guys? I feel pretty good about them. Um, B, B, Brian Thomas, you know, we'll see because he, he's a rookie wide receiver, so we'll see. I do like him. I do think he has a chance to uh, be really, really good. Um, his 80, his, his, his position could take a huge jump if Trevor Lawrence is more closer to that quarterback 7-8 range instead of 13, which I think is a possible outcome for Trevor Lawrence. It's going to directly affect him. Christian Kirk, he's a solid player. Like he, He's a guy you plug into your flex spots, you leave him there, and he'll do what he has to do. Um, ETN, I like them. I like him at running back 7. Um, I think, I'm pretty sure you like, you tear it down for him, so... I'm pretty sure you like where he's at too. Um I'm I'm getting I'm getting irrationally uh, high on Travis Etienne this year. Um I, I am trying to pinpoint why. I think it's just cost. Um specifically like, you know, I'm hitting a lot of these underdog drafts. Underdog is a sponsor of our show. I'm doing a lot of the drafts there. If you guys want to draft on underdog, we have a link in the description. They'll give you up to 250 in bonus cash. Didn't mean to plug it on you, but I just did. So there you go. Uh but I've been drafting a ton of Travis Etienne. He's my second highest drafted player. I think I showed you the other day because we were talking about DeAndre Swift. Swift is my number one etn's my number two like if i'm coming away in drafts with etn and swift you know rb2 rb rb3 or maybe even rb1 rb2 if i wait a little while i'm feeling good like i'm feeling really good about my team i mean i look at etn last year too like a guy who really performed highly at a very high level and it seems like people are forgetting about it as well now people are going to continue to say like well he's not built for a heavy workload and they don't want to give him a heavy workload and they don't want to yada 
every single off-season maneuver by the staff tells you that they don't care. They don't care. They didn't add a running back this offseason. I mean, unless you want to count like sixth round, seventh round pick Keelan Robinson or whatever his name is, like irrelevant, doesn't matter. They add him. He's probably going to be a special teamer. Tank Bigsby's the backup. I mean, we were talking about Tank Bigsby and you can go back and you can look at all of the receipts. We already did a receipt show on Tank Bigsby. I was hype. I, I was actually the opposite end of the spectrum last year where I was talking about Tank Bigsby is going to take stuff away from Travis Etienne. Tank Bigsby is going to, he didn't. Travis Etienne's him. They spent a first round pick on him. Trevor Lawrence is his boy you know like they're gonna get him involved and people are gonna fade him and I'm gonna buy the dip on the fade of Travis Etienne because last year from a fantasy points per game perspective top end running back one numbers each and every week from Travis Etienne just baller PPR half PPR don't matter yeah we're in the same boat at, at this point I finally got to the point after a couple years like okay I'm just gonna stop hating on ETN I was hating on him because I said I think if I remember correctly I said that he was a gadget running a gadget <laughs> running back <laughs> I called him a gadget running back um but at this point I mean he's produced enough where I'm just like okay we're going with we're going we're going with Travis ETN let's let's do it I'm, I'm done hating on him he showed me enough where I'm I feel like he's properly rated so can't say too much bad about Travis ETN uh, also the other let me on the other I was going to say, also, let me, you know, in the league that I tiered down, that's one of the leagues that I have Trevor Lawrence. So I got the little sneaky Trevor Trav uh, stack. Yeah, yeah. I think any, I think Trevor Lawrence is going to raise the level of both ETN and Brian Thomas. Those are the guys that I want for sure on my fantasy dynasty roster. Um, me, I'll tell you, I've said this before. I'm not an Evan Ingram guy. I never, I never have. I'm not going to say I never have been because I was when he was on the Giants, but he's on that list of guys where I'm just like. He burnt you. Yeah, he burnt me. So it's like, screw you forever. So, <laughs> but he is a solid tight end. You know, I just wouldn't add him to my roster, but I definitely wouldn't be against you guys adding him to your roster um it's personal like for the, you i'm starting to get a little i'm starting to get a little excited about these assets on the uh jaguars because i'm getting excited about what trevor lawrence can do yeah man i i also wanted to kind of talk about that too because i i wanted to touch on these two guys um you, you hit the nail on the head brian thomas jr and evan engram evan engram he's a guy that like in dynasty he's a piece that you have to buy as a contender if you're not a contender like the likelihood of his value going down long term is probably much more likely than it is going up uh age obviously being a big factor of that i think he's almost 30 years old uh, he's going to be 29 this year 30 next year uh he's more likely to go down than he goes up last year he's coming off of a career year where he saw a massive massive amount of targets might be hard to replicate that now on a contending team you know tight end 12 you're probably going to get a value you know if you need a tight end to plug in in a you know a tight end premium league and evan engram is the guy you know you can probably go get him at a decent price so uh, I, I think he's a contending buy not a long-term buy for you um, if you're not a contender maybe he's a sell for you uh just based on his production last year but brian thomas jr is the guy that i wanted to talk about because i feel like of all of the receivers in this 2024 class brian thomas jr is getting some of the least amount of hype that i've probably ever seen from a first round wide receiver uh you talk about lad mcconkey getting hype xavier worthy getting hype keon coleman getting hype all of these guys, even like guys like Jermaine Burton uh, for the for the Bengals getting hype. And they were all drafted in the second and third and fourth rounds of NFL drafts. And you have good old Brian Thomas Jr. First round pick sitting there with Trevor Lawrence as the long term number one, the alpha on the outside, the X. And we don't want to talk about him for whatever reason. I don't I don't know. People are going to talk about the way that he was used at LSU. Say so he's kind of gimmicky, big play guy. Hey, yeah. that's what the Jaguars need. They need a big play guy. And I was watching the preseason game uh, last night, the Chiefs and the and the Jags. Brian Thomas Jr., deep ball, throws it to him, one-handed catch, pulls it in to the body. Like, he made the big play deep downfield. He's going to continue to keep doing that. I know that early reports were that, like, he's still, you know, learning how to run routes and be a little bit better of a wide receiver there. But he's good at what he does, and that's big play, touchdown potential type of thing. As a first-round rookie, he's being pretty undervalued. If anybody is going to outperform the ADP and see an increase, this year 
on the Jaguars, it's probably Brian Thomas Jr. I mean, where, where did we say he was going? That's fair. Surprise you if I said this time next year he's a top 20 dynasty wide receiver? Would that surprise you? No. No, because because Trevor Lawrence. I think a part of the reason why people aren't hyping Brian Thomas is because people are doubting Trevor Lawrence. And once they come to realization, like, man, Trevor is closer to that generational quarterback. Maybe he's not Andrew Luck or Peyton Manning, but maybe he's just one shade above. I mean, below. That's still a generational quarterback. So, I mean... I think it's like, I think the two things are related. They're doubting Trevor Lawrence, so they're doubting Brian Thomas, and he's not getting any hype. But no, it would not surprise me. That's just the way that I see it. I don't know. We'll see what happens. But uh, let's move on. Let's talk about the Houston Texans because they are favored to win this division by a long shot. Um, the projected win total is nine and a half games. I don't really know why, because last year... They won 10 games. They made the divisional round of the NFL playoffs and lost to the Baltimore Ravens. And then this offseason, they add Stephon Diggs from the Buffalo Bills, Joe Mixon from the Cincinnati Bengals. And looking at the opening schedule for them, the first five games, top 10 easiest schedule at the quarterback position for C.J. Stroud, top 10 easiest schedule at the running back position for Joe Mixon, top half easiest schedule for the wide receivers of Nico Collins, Tank Dell, Stephon Diggs. I mean, nine and a half wins. What are we doing? This is a smash the over, right? Yeah, it is. It is. It is. I think, and I think partially it's divisional hate. The people, the AFC South has been known to be like the doormat of the NFL since Peyton Manning left the division. But yeah, nine and a half is egregious. Um, They should definitely put down their bulletin board because this is like an 11, 12 win team. So like nine and a half is, is laughable. Um, it, They have, cra- this team has everything. What doesn't this team have? Like, unless people, unless people think that CJ Stroud is going to have a sophomore slump. That's the only thing I could think of. But even then, the team will probably, even with him slumping, the team will still probably beat that win total. So, yeah, I don't know what they're thinking with nine and a half. This is, of today's video, this is the easiest win total to go the higher on for me. Like you said it, 11, 12 wins. This could be a 13 plus win football team. I'm just being honest. Like you said it, they have everything. Good offensive line play. Probably the best wide receiver core in the NFL, top to bottom. Uh, you have a top probably 15 running back in the NFL uh, just in talent. I'd say probably even more if it was just me, but I know some people don't like him. Um, you even have good tight ends in in Dalton Schultz and Kate, I mean, uh, uh, Kate Stover. Defense is good. Will Anderson over there. Like, everything is good, man. D'Amico Ryan's a good defensive coach. Like, I... They added Daniil Hunter from the Vikings this offseason. Like, bro, this team is going to be great. Uh, 10, 10 wins, 11, 12, 13. I don't know, but it's definitely more than nine and a half. Let me smash the over on this one. Yeah, yeah. My, yeah I think I can only think of sophomore slump, division hate, maybe team ownership hate. Like, I don't, I don't know. I, I don't know what the conspiracy is for why they're only at nine and a half. I don't know, but let's talk about the fantasy options because they have a ton of them that are going to be exciting for us. Uh, you got CJ Stroud here as QB3. Nico Collins is wide receiver 16, followed by Tank Dell, wide receiver 20. Stefan Diggs, wide receiver 41. Uh, that's unfamiliar territory for Diggs these days. Joe Mixon, running back 23. Dalton Schultz, tight end 19. And Damian Pierce cracks the top 250 as running back 62. How are we feeling about these guys? Um, I guess more specifically, like, is this the order that you would put the wide receiver room? A lot of people are going to have questions about the wide receiver room. Is this the order you would put it for Dynasty? Nico, Tank, Diggs. Man, man they're going to have three top 30 wide receivers. Yeah, I said it. They're going to have three top 30 wide receivers. They have the third best friend. Like, he's probably, he, now his, his ranking is is locked loaded that's where he is he's after josh allen and Mahomes. like that's what cj stroud is um i think they're gonna have three top 30 receivers i do not know what's it, what it's gonna look like in terms of where each one of the three slot i do think however that having stefan diggs at 41 I think people are getting a little too carried away. I think the pendulum of of him not being good has swung too far in the other direction at this point. They're looking at what was happening last season, and I'll just be completely honest. I think him and Josh Allen were having problems, and I think that contributed to some of the fall off by Stefan Diggs. Josh Allen couldn't even, when they asked him if he missed Diggs the other day, he couldn't even give like a straight answer. He kind of just was just like, eh. 
uh, so like that's a tough question to ask though as well like especially yeah, in that wide receiver room with rookies and new guys like you're not gonna be like yeah i miss my old guy yeah but you know he could at least phrase them in a way like you know yeah i i, I miss having him in the locker room yada 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 but we got some good guys here da 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 yeah but i love that guy you know he's one of my better friends like yeah you could have said something like that yeah i think i think i think if he could have a moment of honesty he would say he's happy Diggs is gone um haven't heard too many complaints so far from Diggs. um this season like so far don't think he's gonna be there after this season but um, it's a one year deal for the most part yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think he wants to play with his brother. But um, I think he's I was also just yeah. going to say that, dude. I was going to say, I think he signs with Dallas at the end of the season. Like, next offseason, yeah. he goes to Dallas and plays with CD. Yeah, yeah. So I think that he has incentive to go out there and put a lot of good tape out. So I think Nico Collins, um, Tank Dale, I think they're also going to be top 30 receivers. I just don't know the order. Like, are these younger guys going to be like, okay, it's Stefan Diggs. We kind of know how Stefan Diggs is. Let's, you know, let me make sure he gets his get his, gets his so did you see the little uh even be on the list even if he is in the top 50 he shouldn't even yeah. be there He's a- did you see the li- uh the little videos on twitter of the preseason game they made a big thing out of it i thought it was so overblown and so crazy that people were trying to spin the narrative already uh but stefan Diggs in the preseason game they had like two drives with cj stroud it was like he, the starters only got two drives he was targeted zero times uh in the two drives and uh Diggs was on the sideline like talking through routes and releases with cj stroud like just kind of like trying to get on the same page as him talking about it people were like making it about Diggs, like complaining about targets he's like over there trying to work on routes i thought it was ridiculous i thought it was ridiculous stefan Diggs doesn't care if he's getting targeted in preseason week one for one drive yeah but i think if we had to bet if at some point he's going to complain about his targets i would say i would bet yes. that yes he, he's stefan Diggs, so like it's going to happen um stefan Diggs. two things he doesn't like is losing and and not being a part of winning as yeah. far as like getting his touches so that's why i said man they need to just make sure to keep that dude happy at least give him like give him some targets every game but um and he's going to come somewhere at some point i just think i think for me man like if i were to rank these guys that's the order that i would have it for dynasty nico uh dell Diggs in a one-year sprint you know maybe i'm a contending roster i I actually like Diggs this year. I think Diggs can be, I think he's undervalued in the community. Wide receiver 41. I mean, you said they're going to have three top 30 guys. Like it's going to be hard to know when to start them because every guy is going to have a boom game. You know, Nico's going to have games where he gets two touchdowns. Dale's going to have a game where he gets two touchdowns. Diggs is going to get a game where he gets, you know, 10 catches for 150 yards. Like it's going to happen. It's going to be hard to kind of judge that just because the offense is going to be so free flowing and it's going to be so high scoring. Um, There's going to be games where, you know, Joe Mixon might get in for two or three touchdowns on the ground. Like that's just the way that this offense is going to be uh but i think Diggs is going to be undervalued so if you're a contender i i think earlier in the offseason you probably could have bought Diggs for cheaper than you can now because people are starting to kind of get around on the idea that okay Diggs is going to be involved but if you can go get Diggs on a contending roster for any any second round pick I'm doing it because I think he'll perform as a top 25 yeah. type of wide receiver this year. Yeah. These, these rooms, the NFL, these teams are getting really annoying now with, with loading up their wide receiver room so much. It makes it hell for fantasy people who play fantasy football. Like it's great in real life, but like you got teams like the Texans, the Bears, the Packers, where it's like, okay, what is this guy going to do on a given week? Um, I like Diggs if you can get him for a second round pick. I actually have a team where I have, um, him, Brandon Ayuk, and Marvin Harrison is like my three wide receivers, and I'm comfortable with that. I'm comfortable yeah, I with mean, that. You should so be. yeah. But there's some people who are like, Oh yeah, I'm gonna have digs coming off the bench, or I'm gonna have digs the flex. Come on. No, I mean I have I have a team where uh I have AJ Brown, Stefan Diggs, uh, Romo Dunze, Jordan Addison. Like I have a couple like guys where it's going to be hard to know. Kind of you might have to play them on matchups, but like I'm comfortable throwing Diggs in every week as you know my wide receiver two, wide receiver three. Like I'm I'm comfortable with that. I don't, I'm not too worried about it, especially in the offense he's in. Um, it's going to be fast paced, high scoring, all the good stuff that you want. Uh, I also think same. I've already hinted at it. Joe Mixon, he's undervalued. Uh, I just, I'm sorry. People don't like to hear it. He is. You're talking about a guy being valued as the running back 23 in dynasty. He's probably going to be a top 12 guy this year. Sorry. 
Got Joe Mix, that's Andrew's oldest son. He is his oldest son. You know, he has a few I, kids around the NFL. Mixon is the oldest <laughs> one. <laughs> I don't I don't know why. Look, I I love players that I can get at good value. And for whatever reason, I I know the reason. I think a lot of people devalue Joe Mixon because they don't like the person of Joe Mixon. Um, yeah. So that's probably partially of like why he gets devalued in the community. Also, now we're getting the age dip on Joe Mixon as well. Like he's 27 ish years old. Like people are going to dip him in age. So now I'm just look, this is a guy on one of the best offenses in football. He's probably going to get a lot of touchdown opportunities. And oh, yeah, by the way, let me remind you last year he finished as the running back five. He was a top five running back last year. And Maybe an improved offense. Can we say that the Texans are an improved offense? I was about to say that. Top five running back going to a team where the quarterback is, is could be better and definitely, if not better, more available than Joe Burrow. Um, more scoring was, opportunities than they had last year in Cincinnati. Exactly. Um, and you're going to have teams so focused on the three wide receivers on that team that the running back is probably going to get to eat all day. So He's a buy for a contender. If you're, in, if you're a, you know, not contender, don't buy Joe Mixon, but you know. I tried to acquire. I'm not gonna lie. I'm probably gonna try to acquire him again in that same league where I got digs. I'm probably gonna try to acquire him again after we get off of this video. I'm I'm trying to do something sneaky in one of my leagues where uh, I have Derrick Henry, who for whatever reason the community views Derrick Henry higher than Joe Mixon, uh, even though Henry is older. But they're both in similar situations, so I'm trying to do the thing where it's like you take my Derrick Henry. And I'll take your Joe Mixon and you give me a piece on top of that. Like, let me just get an extra piece thrown in. But it's like, I'm probably going to get similar production. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, it can be. I think, I think, and, and if we're talking about running backs who are probably at good value, who are going to outperform their value, you're going to have a guy like Joe Mixon. You're going to have a guy like DeAndre Swift. I think, honestly, your strategy for trading Henry for a running back in a piece, I mean, you could do that for Mixon or a guy like Swift. So I yep. think those are both like pretty good, good strategies to go with. Yes, sir. All right, man. Well, that is it. We talked AFC South. Uh, you know, players to watch this year, who's going to increase in value, who's going to decrease in value, sleepers, breakouts, all that good stuff. Um, just running through these divisional breakdowns, man, that's what we're going to be doing over the next couple of weeks. We already hit the NFC North and the AFC North. So if you guys want to go check that out, you can go check that out. It's going to be one of the first videos in the Let's Talk Dynasty playlist that we have on the channel. Strongly encourage you guys could, uh, to go look at that. Also, if you haven't already, you want to support the show, the best free way to support the show is to hit the like button, hit the subscribe button, uh, share it, comment, do all the good stuff for YouTube. Um, unfortunately, you know, there is an algorithm and you got to do those things for us, for us to do well in the algorithm. It's not just watch it, you know, your favorite creator and they'll do well. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, it's it's the way content is. So I appreciate you guys uh, watching. If you spend the time to watch, listen, do any of that stuff, I appreciate you taking, you know, 10 more seconds to do the other things that help us grow. So uh, we have a goal of 3,000 subscribers by week one it's a lofty goal we'll see if we hit it I'm, I'm shooting for the moon hopefully landing somewhere amongst the stars that's the way we're gonna do it but uh that's all we have for you guys today so next of these videos coming out will be the nfc south so we'll be talking about those teams um specifically the panthers saints buccaneers and falcons so if you're excited for that again that'll be coming out on thursday uh, War, what do you have for the people before we get out of here? Check us out over on Crimson Mass Pro Wrestling. We talk about WWE. We talk about AEW. Over there, our goal is to hit 2,000 subscribers by the end of the year. You know, so that's what we're trying to do. We post videos, shorts throughout the week. We post videos every weekend. Maybe not this weekend. We'll see. Got homework to do, brothers and sisters. But, uh, <laughs> but yeah, man, check us out. Crimson Mass Pro Wrestling. Pro Wrestling with an attitude. Hell yeah, man. All right, guys, we appreciate you. We'll see you on the next episode. But until then, peace out.